My name is Elena, and what I encountered during my first night shift at a Florida Walmart still haunts my dreams. It was the lead up to the holiday season, yet the store was eerily quiet, a stark contrast to the festive cheer that filled the air outside. I was assigned to restock shelves, a simple task, I thought, until I reached aisle seven. Aisle seven, with its array of toys, should have been a place of joy and laughter, but instead, it was the epicenter of unexplained phenomena that had both staff and shoppers whispering in hushed tones. Toys were found scattered off their shelves, an inexplicable chill surrounded you as soon as you walked there. And sometimes, if you listen closely, you'd hear the cries of a child. On that first night, as I approached the aisle, I thought that I saw a child staring at me from the distance. Odd hours, not many adults around. I worried that the child was lost. But as I went towards him, he disappeared. Another employee, sensing my confusion, casually remarked that it's Samuel. That is when I learned that a few years ago, the store was engulfed in a small fire. A woman was trapped in flames. Her boy ran and saved her, but suffocated in the smoke. This revelation cast a shadow over aisle seven, the joy it once held replaced by a lingering sorrow. The haunting grew more intense with each passing night, toys hurled off shelves with unseen force aimed directly at me. Spectral footprints appeared in the dust, leading nowhere, and Samuel's sobbing became a constant backdrop to my shift. While my colleagues largely ignored the obvious paranormal phenomenon, I somehow felt that he was reaching out to me, desperate to communicate. Driven by a mix of fear and determination, I resolved to understand Samuel's purpose, to find a way to help him find peace. As my shift drew to a close, Samuel's sobs echoed one last time down aisle seven. I knew then that I could not turn away and have to help this lost soul, no matter the cost. The next evening, I returned to Walmart with a dare. I would communicate with Samuel, reach out to him in a way that transcended the barriers between the living and the spirit trapped in sorrow. Armed with sacks of salt from the store shelves, I reached aisle seven. I researched about communicating with spirits online and found that salt acts as a powerful medium to bridge the gap. I punctured the sacks and spread the salt on the dark floor. The store was quieter than usual. The fluorescent lights flickered above, casting long shadows that seemed to dance at the edge of my vision. I called out to Samuel, my voice steady despite the pounding of my heart. Samuel, if you're here, I want to help you. Can you understand me? But nothing. I said it again, and this time, a toy truck flew off the shelf to my right. The air suddenly grew colder, and then the salt began to shift, forming words in response to my plea. His response was a single word, but it carried the weight of his longing and confusion. My eyes welled with tears as I realized the depth of his despair. Samuel didn't know he was gone, trapped in a world he no longer belonged to. Samuel, you're safe with me. I want to help you find peace. The salt shifted again, the grains moving with purpose. It was then I understood. Samuel was lost, not just in the afterlife, but in his understanding of his fate. He was searching for his mother, clinging to the hope that she could still save him. As we communicated, Samuel revealed his heart's desire. Before the fire, his mother had given him a ring. In his last moments, Consumed by smoke and flames, he had lost it. He wanted his mother's ring. The revelation was a turning point. If the ring was the key to Samuel's unrest, then finding it was my mission. A coworker, intrigued by my late night endeavors, shared a piece of forgotten lore. The store had been rebuilt. Flooring had been done over the original. If the ring existed, it was hidden beneath us. Fueled by a newfound resolve, I enlisted the help of sympathetic coworkers. After hours, armed with tools borrowed from the hardware section, we began our dig beneath the store. The work was hard, the floor unyielding, but the thought of Samuel's soul finding peace drove us forward. Finally, 
our efforts bore fruit. Beneath layers of dust and debris, we found a ring, its metal warm against the cold ground. As I held it aloft, the store suddenly plunged into darkness, the lights flickering out, leaving us in an abyss of shadows. When the lights returned, the ring was gone from my hand, but so was the chilling presence that had haunted aisle seven. In its place was a warmth, a comforting feeling that enveloped us. The air was lighter, the shadows receded, and the oppressive atmosphere that had dominated the store was lifted. Samuel's sobbing, the laughter, and the cold drafts were gone. Aisle seven, once a site of sorrow and fear, now felt just like any other part of the store. The toys lay in their places, untouched by unseen hands, the air free of the sound of weeping. As dawn broke, casting its light through the front windows of the store, I knew Samuel had found his peace. The ring, a symbol of a mother's love, had freed him, allowing his spirit to move on. The store, once a site of tragedy, now held a sense of calm, a testament to the power of compassion and determination. Walking out into the morning light, I felt a weight lift from my shoulders. The haunting of aisle seven was over, and with it, my fear. Samuel's story, a tale of loss and longing, had reached its end, but the journey had changed me, taught me the strength of the human spirit and the unbreakable bonds of love. As I stepped into the dimly lit cavernous space of the Walmart in Austin, the air was thick with tension, a stark contrast to the usual hum of daily commerce. A call had come in as a typical hostage situation, surprisingly just when I was driving to work to quit my job. But I changed my mind because the brief on the suspect was anything but typical. A woman, claiming invisible forces controlled the fate of all within, had shot dead three people and taken several hostages. She came armed with makeshift weapons and DIY bombs. Her demand? She just wanted the president to acknowledge that there was no free will and invisible threads were manipulating their lives. I approached cautiously. The store looked like the aftermath of a storm, chaos everywhere. I had to walk for a good 10 minutes to reach the counter where she had barricaded herself and the hostages. The woman was Dr. Cassandra Lyle, a name that had once been associated with groundbreaking theoretical physics but now was synonymous with chaos. She was wheezing like a rabid dog, crying, then laughing, (laughs) then talking to herself, then suddenly shooting a bullet in the air. Welcome, negotiator. She called out, as if she had been expecting me, her figure emerging from the shadows. She was smaller than I'd imagined, but the guns in her hands were unmistakably real and deadly. I introduced myself, keeping my voice steady. Dr. Lyle, let's talk about how we can resolve this peacefully. A laugh escaped her. (laughs) Peace? There's no peace in being controlled. It's just a state of mind, and the world will know it soon. She had a lot to say, so I had to patiently listen, make her believe that I could be on her side. She lectured on the nature of reality, control, and the experiments that had shattered her mind. It was evident that Cassandra was not just smart. She was a genius, pushed to the brink. Her theories, once celebrated in the academic world, now served as the foundation of her delusion that she could untangle her fate by exposing others to the truth of their manipulation. The chaos she orchestrated around us was a demonstration of her theory. Shells toppled over, messages written with bullets, hostages positioned in calculated spots, along with motion sensors throughout the store. If one tried to run, two others would be shot by homemade sensor-triggered guns. They were all lab rats to her. Look around you, she urged, gesturing to the chaos. This is no random act. It's a carefully constructed experiment. 
and that's when it hit me. I was a part of it too. The negotiation, my presence was her plan. For someone who believed the world is controlled by invisible threads, she wanted to prove that she's controlling this. The stakes have never been higher. I wasn't just negotiating for the hostages' lives. I was fighting to prove we weren't just pawns in her deranged game. Her movements were unpredictable, yet patterned. It was clear she was steps ahead, anticipating moves in a game only she fully understood. As we spoke, her monologues veered between lucidity and madness. She spoke of her research, detailing experiments that blurred the lines between physics and philosophy, reality and perception. The hostages were chess pieces in her grand design. She wanted the world to see, to understand the invisible thread she believed controlled them. But in her eyes, I saw more than just a desire to enlighten. There was a plea for validation, for someone to acknowledge her genius. Realizing this, I shifted tactics, engaging her not as a negotiator to a hostage taker, but as a peer to a scientist. I questioned her theories, challenged her conclusions, and in doing so, saw the first flicker of doubt cross her face. It was a small victory, but a crack in the armor she had built around her psyche. I'm not your enemy, Cassandra. I found myself saying, using her first name in an attempt to reach the person behind the psychosis. But this isn't the way to prove your theories. Her laughter, sharp and sudden, cut through the tension. <laughs> you think this is about proving something to the world? No. This? This is about proving something to myself. The game changed in that moment. It was no longer about the invisible threads of control, but about a woman trying to reclaim her authority. The realization was my opening, the weakness in her strategy I had been searching for. With careful words, I began to dismantle the world she had built in the store, pointing out the inconsistencies in her actions and the reality she perceived. Slowly, the fervor in her eyes dimmed, replaced by confusion, then realization. The guns lowered, her posture slumped, and for the first time since the standoff began, Cassandra Lyle looked defeated. It was then, in her moment of vulnerability, that the real battle was won. The SWAT team, having waited for my signal, moved in, securing the store and ensuring the safety of all inside. Dr. Lyle was taken into custody. In the aftermath, as the hostages were led out to the embrace of waiting loved ones, Cassandra was pulled away by four men as she yelled at the top of her voice and threw her hands around. The store lights flickered back to normalcy, and just as the mad woman was being taken out past me, she stopped, looked into my eyes for a few seconds, and smiled before saying, I broke the threads so I will be put down but they don't know that you broke them too. This left me puzzled. What did she mean by that? And that is when it hit me. If she had not orchestrated all of this, I would have quit my job right now. The invisible threads wanted that of me, but because of her deadly game, I changed my fate and learned her theory. I broke the invisible threads too because of her. The truth like the invisible thread she spoke of, remained elusive, tangled in the intersection of science, belief, and the human mind's unfathomable depths. But I had a feeling that I had a lot more work to do. This happened just a couple of weeks ago when I went to Walmart one night. I think it was about 8 o'clock, and I went there to only get a few things. When I got inside the store, it seemed pretty normal to me. It wasn't too busy, and it wasn't completely dead either. I didn't waste any time and started walking to the right. The first thing on my list was to get some more soap. As I was walking down that way, I remember seeing a man walking in the opposite direction. He was wearing a shirt that said, Human Mammal, on it. I specifically remember seeing that. But afterwards, I passed him by and kept walking. After getting the soap, I then headed towards the back end of the store. I was over there getting the last several items, and it took me a little bit over five minutes. Then I headed back towards the front end of the store. 
When I made it a little more than halfway to the front, that particular area was very quiet. But there was one person there, and they caught my attention. It was the man that I had seen earlier, and he was standing in a random aisle, just pushing things off the shelf. It was like he was trying to make a mess. The man had slightly long, dark hair, was somewhat big, and a little bit less than six feet tall. When I saw him doing this, I couldn't help but look. I was going to just keep walking past him, but when I got kind of close to him, I stopped. The man looked at me as he continued throwing things on the floor. I asked him what he was doing. I didn't say it in a way as if I worked at Walmart or as if I was mad at him. I was just genuinely curious. The man looked at me as I spoke, but did not stop his actions. After my question, he looked away and completely ignored me. I looked around and did not see any employees in the immediate area. When I looked back to the man, he was giving me the middle finger. I thought about saying something to the guy, but decided not to and just walked away. Somebody would see what he was doing soon enough, and he would probably get kicked out of the store or banned. I walked the rest of the way over to the self-checkouts. Then I checked out and started to leave. Well, I guess as I was checking out, the man in the human mammal shirt walked over to me without me knowing. Because as soon as I was walking into the parking lot, I looked back and saw the guy walking behind me. He was like 50 feet back, and at first, I wasn't sure if he just happened to be leaving at the same time as me or not. I don't even know why I decided to look behind me, but I'm glad that I did. The guy appeared to be looking right at me, which was strange, but I ignored it. I continued as normal, and got to my car, unlocked it, and went inside. I wasn't in a rush to leave or anything, but when I started the engine and was getting ready to back out, I saw him. The human mammal had followed me all the way to my car, and was now standing right behind it. He was looking at me through the rear window of my vehicle. I waited for about a minute, and he didn't move at all. Then, I rolled down my window and yelled to the guy, asking him to move. He ignored me completely. He just stood there with barely any expression on his face. This guy was really confusing to me. I honked my horn and he still didn't move. So then, I turned my engine off and got out of my car. At first, the man still didn't move. I asked him what his problem was and he still ignored me. I wasn't really sure what to do. I didn't want to get in the guy's face or anything because he seemed sort of unpredictable. I decided to walk back inside Walmart. As I went through the parking lot, the man calmly walked behind me, following me yet again. By the time I made it to the doors, he was maybe 10 feet behind me. When I walked inside, I wasn't really sure where to go, so I just started walking. But when I made it sort of past the self-checkouts, I saw a few employees standing around. The man behind me was still about 10 feet back, and one of the employees approached him. He tried to walk past, but another employee walked in front of him. I heard that they were confronting him about throwing things off the shelves of the aisles. Somebody must have seen him, or possibly he was seen on security cameras. This allowed me to get away from the guy, and I turned around and left the store while he was still there. This time, he wasn't able to follow me. I left and haven't seen him since. Hopefully he was banned from the store or something. I'm really not sure why he did all of that. It was like he was just trying to cause problems.